Hey, I'm Chris Ralph, the Professional Prospector, and today we're going to talk about something that very few individual prospectors ever talk about or think about. It's gold and cyanide. Now, you know, I, the truth is that most newly mined gold comes from cyanide extraction processes. Now, you know, most individual prospectors are interested in placer gold and and nuggets and that sort of thing, metal detecting, panning, sluicing, dry washing, all that stuff you end up with individual particles of gold. Some, you know, fairly small, but nuggets, of course, you can find some pretty big ones. But in commercial mining, it's a lot different. Um, you know, and, and the vast majority comes from cyanide, and that counts both individual prospectors like us, commercial mining that may look like this. This is your basic medium to large scale commercial type operation in Alaska and elsewhere that you might kind of see on some of the gold rush shows or something like that on TV. They produce a lot more gold than your typical individual prospector, but nothing compared to the really big open pit mines. And even artisanal mining in, you know, uh, countries where guys work for a few dollars a day and consider that good. It, it's all that stuff added together is only kind of a, you know, maybe 15% of all gold that's newly mined comes from us guys doing placer. The rest comes from hard rock. Now, I want to be sure to let you guys know that this is not a how-to video. Uh, cyanide is a pretty dangerous poison, and we'll talk a little bit about it. But it's this is not a how-to video. I'm not going to tell you all the possible problems that you could have, or all the the things that you could do wrong that could lead to poison or you know injury or even death. Cyanide is, uh, like I say, pretty dangerous stuff. We'll talk a little bit more about cyanide and safety later on in this video, but we're going to talk about how cyanide is used and why it's used, okay? Almost all of it, well, really all hard rock ores have at least some particles of gold that are just teeny tiny, smaller than 300 mesh, 500 mesh, 1000 mesh, microscopic, little tiny particles. And in the old days, the miners, you know, they would uh, run their stamp mills and the, uh, the crushed ore would go over mercury plates and then usually over some sort of a sluice system, trying to catch any bit of gold that they could. But a certain amount of that gold is just tiny, tiny, tiny particles. And when you get particles that are small enough, you just can't recover it with uh, some sort of uh, sluice box or, or uh, other gravity-based system, even a shaker table won't do it when you get to small enough particles. And, and one thing that I do want to say to people that goes along in that line is, you know, if you do a sluice box and you clean out your, your concentrates or a shaker table and you get some two and 300 mesh gold, and that doesn't mean you're getting the majority of it. It doesn't mean you're even getting half of it. You may be getting 10% of it or 5% of it. And the most of it, you know, when you get down to that really small scale, the most of it goes out in the tailings. And the old timers would be able to tell this. What they do is they, you know, take assays of their ore and they'd run a whole bunch of assays and maybe they found, let's for round numbers, let's say they found that their ore ran one ounce per ton. Well, then they'd run a hundred tons or something like that through it, and again, just for round numbers, and if it was one ounce per ton and you ran a hundred tons, you'd expect to get a hundred ounces back, right? Well, they would run it and they would find that, uh, you know, maybe they got 90 ounces, maybe only 85 ounces. And, and they would scratch their head, how come? And well, then they would do assays on the tailings that they got out, and sure enough, the tailings maybe run a tenth of an ounce a ton. If, if you started at the head, it is uh, head grade is one ounce. Maybe the tailings would run, you know, a tenth of an ounce. 
or maybe the tailings would run eight, eight hundredths or five hundredths or something like that. And the reason for that is that a lot of, like I say, virtually all kinds of gold ore have some tiny, tiny particles that can't be recovered by gravity. And this goes to, uh, you know, if you're going to do hard rock processing, you know, you find a pocket, which I'm going to talk about a friend of mine working a rich pocket here very shortly in the next couple of videos, next few videos. So be sure and keep an eye out for that one. But if you're working hard rock or crushing it, you're getting some nice gold out of it. That's great. But there's a certain amount of that that's really tiny particles that you're just not getting. And the old time miners knew this, uh, you know, but for a long time in the 1800s, they figured, what could we do? You know, we knew that though that there's these little tiny particles in there, but we, how do we get them? And, uh, and then the truth is, is that um, in modern times, geologists have discovered huge ore bodies of this really tiny gold that the old timers couldn't work. A lot of it can't even be panned. And, um, one of the things that, that's Nevada where I'm from is, is famous for is the Carlin type gold deposits. And in these deposits, the gold is microscopic. Literally, um, the vast majority of the gold you, you can't see with your eyeball. And so, uh, you know, you need a microscope I you mean, know, eyeball just directly. You need a microscope to see those tiny, tiny particles. Now, they're there, it's gold, but it's just so small, you could never recover it in any kind of gravity based system. And, you know, if those deposits were known in the 1800s, in the mid 1800s, that kind of thing, there would have been nothing they could do with them. They could assay that rock and they'd get a number that said, oh, yeah, it has half an ounce per ton. Um, but there's nothing that they could do with it because they would run it through their stamp mill and their uh, mercury tables and that kind of stuff. And maybe they'd get two or three percent recovery if they were lucky. <laughs> and so, you know, they couldn't do anything with those. But in modern times, geologists have discovered huge part, uh, bodies like this. Literally in Nevada, we produce many millions of ounces of gold per year just from that kind of super fine gold particle size that's microscopic. Other deposits around the world also are either uh, all microscopic or you know just a, a mostly a grade a size of gold particle that's so small it's just there's no hope of recovering it by gravity methods. So the old time miners looked for some sort of thing. They wanted you know something that could get those tiny particles and really logically the way to get those tiny particles is to dissolve them and then recover them out of the liquid so you know let's take a look at some of the giant mining operations that we have now that work on these kinds of particles and talk about them these are huge mines with giant equipment that process huge amounts of rock every day and most of them mine 10,000, 20,000, even up to 50,000 tons of ore a day. It's a huge amount of rock and a very large operation. They employ large amounts of big equipment, uh, scoops that may have 20 to 30 tons per scoop of the digging device and, and trucks that may handle 50 to 250 or even more tons just in a single truckload. And the mines themselves are gigantic. They take up large parts of mountain ranges. And the whole key to this type of operation is that they handle huge amounts of rock very quickly and at very low cost. They move things and they sort and treat and do it at a low cost. Here's an example of some of this Carlin type gold ore from Nevada. Now, it doesn't look like much of anything, and honestly, if I was out hiking around and I saw a rock that looked like this, I wouldn't blink twice. But this rock has $175 to $200 a ton of gold in it. And, you know, these mines, because of their huge size and the large amount of material that they handle, they're able to process rock like this for, you know, something on the ballpark of about $25 U.S. per ton. So when you figure you're talking 175 to 200 dollars per ton, it costs you 25 dollars a ton to get the gold out. 
you know, you can see that these operations are hugely profitable. But they needed to have some sort of way to get the gold out, this microscopic gold, the way to get it out and get it out of the rock cheaply. So with a, a, an operation like those, you know, that produce millions of ounces these days in modern times, you need a cheap, stable, a chemical that can easily dissolve gold, uh, but doesn't dissolve a whole lot of other stuff that you don't want, all right? Um, and about 130 years ago, uh, a chemist in England uh, came up with an idea. It had been found uh, through experimenting around that uh, cyanide could dissolve gold. And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about, and we'll talk about it in a little bit more. But his name was John MacArthur, and he discovered that he could figure out a way to use cyanide to dissolve the gold, and then the gold would be in solution, just like dissolving you know, uh, sugar in, in a cup of water. The sugar's still there, it's just dissolved in the water. But he could, you know, with sugar, you can let the water evaporate or boil it off and the sugar will recrystallize and you'll have your sugar back. Well, the same thing, the gold is in the liquid and he figured out a way without having to boil all the liquid off to recover the gold out of solution. And how they do that is with zinc. Zinc metal, and, and there's other metals that do this, not just zinc, but uh, zinc was the easy, cheap one that they found that worked well and, and was, was easy to use. Zinc will displace the gold from the liquid. So you have a liquid with dissolved gold in it and you can expose it to zinc metal and what will happen is the gold that's in the solution will come out and turn into metal and the zinc that's the metal will go into solution. So it's a displacement reaction. Literally the uh, zinc displaces the gold out of solution and the gold comes out and you get solid gold. As a bonus, cyanide also works for extracting silver. It's not quite as good at silver as it, or, uh, on extracting silver as it is with gold, but it works well. And a lot of silver these days is mined with uh, cyanide. Same sort of thing. Now, the process of cyanide requires air and water. And uh, let's take a look at that and talk about the chemistry of how it works. So how the process works is it's pretty simple, although, you know, don't think that, uh, that this is all there is to it because really um, you got to control the acid, uh, basic pH and other things, but it really is gold, which is this, the chemical symbol for it, plus cyanide. That's a symbol for cyanide plus water and oxygen gives hydroxide and gold cyanide and you have but you have to have oxygen and you have to have water it doesn't happen dry and so the two big processes that they use well anyway this is it and when it was invented um, it, it worked so well and became suddenly so popular that many big and productive old mines actually went back to their tailings and uh, uh, reprocess the tailings. I mean, they'd put tailings out in big tailing storage areas, you know, keep them from running downstream and causing problems. You know, they'd stored their tailings. Well, they actually went and dug tailings back up and ran them through their mill to get the last little bit of gold out of them. So they went from getting maybe 85, 90% recovery to now that they had cyanide, they were getting 96, 98 pretty good recovery and that's how they got and so they had all those tailings out there that might have a tenth of an ounce or something like that but they didn't have to mine them they didn't have to do anything all they had to do was haul them back to the mill screen them and run them back through the process again with the new cyanide process so it was very profitable and after a certain point um, sometime uh, around the turn of the century maybe a little before uh, basically everybody that was doing any significant scale mining, you know, whether you were talking uh, 
you know, little guys, you know, working by themselves or one or two guys, you know, that, that didn't happen this way. But in larger scale mines, they all, convert, everybody converted to cyanide because it was so economic and so beneficial. So let's talk about how they processed the ore. So the ore would be crushed just like it was in stamp mills in the early days. They still use stamp mills in the turn of the century, 120 plus years ago. Um, they would crush the ore with stamp mills and they would then go to a vat leach. So they built big vats and they would put the ore slurry and they would mix the cyanide into the liquid of the slurry and they would have this big slurry and they stirred it around and they bubbled air through it because remember it requires oxygen they bubbled air through it and uh, you know stirred it around and kept it for a certain amount of time and after the amount of time the gold would be dissolved and then they would uh, take the material and and they would wash it they would drain off all the liquid that they could drain they would wash it a couple times to wash off any of the the gold bearing cyanide that was in the liquid sticking to the particles you wash it off get it clean and then they would recover the the gold from that and um now one of the things that i want to say about big scale minings long ago and even today is that you cannot process coarse material with cyanide and that's why many mines have a some sort of a, a coarse run material. So they would run it through a table or a sluice box or some other way of recovering any coarse gold that was in the ore. And then the f finer gold that wasn't recovered in the, the coarse gravity processing, that would be treated by cyanide. So why can't you process big coarse gold through, will, will coarse gold not dissolve like this? Yeah, it dissolves like this. It goes through the same process. But the problem is, this is a process that works at reasonable speed with 300 mesh, 500 mesh. Um, it, it, it cutoff is around 150 mesh. If it's 150 mesh, you can dissolve it within a couple of days. But if you start talking about gold that's, you know, half a gram or a gram, you know, nuggety gold, it could take years and years and years to dissolve big pieces like that. So it just doesn't dissolve real fast, unless the particle's tiny. If the particle's tiny, it dissolves fast. If the particles are big, it takes forever to dissolve them. So many mines will have a process that they do a gravimetric to get out all the coarse gold, and then cyanide to get the fine particles of gold. So I mentioned vat leaching, and that was really the method of using cyanide until sometime in the 1960s, and was actually invented by some scientists here in Nevada, they invented a process called heap leaching. Let me show you a couple of heap leaches. Now here's a picture of a large heap leach in Nevada. It's not the yellow flat area in the foreground, and it's not the darker hills in the background, but you can see the light colored area in the mid ground that looks like it's layers, one layer on top of another. That's, they're as big as hills, but that's a heap leach where they've stacked up rock and they're leaching gold and silver out of the rock. Again, you see the light colored uh, area out in the mid ground. This is a huge area that they've laid plastic underneath and they're going to sprinkle cyanide on top of it. This is another giant heap leach. You can see they're huge. I mean, these are mountains. Remember I told you that the geologists had discovered these gigantic deposits of low grade or most of which was really fine gold. And, uh, and what they did was literally uh, do a process like this. Let me show you the, the process of how a heap leach works. So this diagram shows that uh, the heap uh, underneath where it says geomembrane layer, that's basically a thick sheet of plastic that is impervious. So whatever liquids come down to that will drain off of it. You can see it's put on a small slope so that the liquid drains off into, here they have a green and labeled pregnant solution. But uh, the lifts of or are stacked up on each other one on top of the next and uh, they'll build the first layer and then sprinkle cyanide on that and then when they've got most of the 
gold and or silver out of it. They'll build the next lift and sprinkle cyanide on that and build the next lift up and the next lift up and so on and so forth. And that way they literally leach this type of, of thing for years and it can grow to be several hundred feet high. It's basically a, a hill in and of itself. And heap leaching is probably the simplest version. Now, with either vat leaching or heap leaching, you end up with a gold-bearing solution, right? You have liquid water with dissolved gold in it, right? And in order to recover the gold, you've got to get the gold out of the liquid and then into your hand, into a bar or something. So there's two main extraction methods that are used today for uh, for recovering gold out of the solution. One is activated carbon. And what will happen is if you have the right kind of carbon, and they make especially carbon for this purpose, um, you have the right kind of carbon particles, you can run a gold bearing, this gold cyanide solution through the, uh, the bed of, uh, and, and usually when they do this, they have big giant beds of these bits of carbon. The bed may where you may have tons of, of carbon in it, but they're little particles. They're little, you know, pea size and smaller. And they're not dust, they're not s sand, but they're, you know, something on the order of uh, four to eight, to maybe at most 10 mesh and, and that kind of size. And uh, the, the gold solution will just go through this bed of carbon. And what happens is, the gold, the gold cyanide has a tendency to be captured on the, on the carbon. The carbon just kind of sucks it in and grabs it like a magnet. Now it can only load up so much. There is a point where, you know, you keep loading gold on, loading gold on, loading gold onto the carbon, uh, but you still don't have a bar, right? You still don't have uh, an actual bit of gold that you can do something with. So what happens after that is you now have a bunch of carbon, tons of carbon with many ounces of gold loaded onto it. And they will strip then the, uh, the gold off the carbon. And there's a process for doing that. And, and so you end up when, when they strip it, you end up with a solution that's much richer. You know, you may have had, uh, your gold dissolved into, you know, 50,000 gallons of water, 100,000 gallons of water, and a huge amount, you concentrate that on the carbon, and then when they strip it off, you might have the same amount of gold in 50 or 100 gallons of liquid. So the, the gold has a much higher concentration of, or the, I'm sorry, the liquid has a much higher concentration of gold in it, and they use a process called electrowinning, and it's basically like a plating process. Uh, a lot of times the, uh, the, part that's used to capture the gold, they um, use a coarse steel wool and they run electricity through it and the uh, electrical current flowing through there will cause the gold to come out and go onto the, the iron and it mixes and, and gold and iron don't alloy. And so you end up with this fine material that's uh, part iron and part metallic gold. And the, when you get this, it doesn't look gold because we I've done stuff like this and the, the particles that you get are just black to dark gray. Um, the other process that they use is called Merrill Crow. And Merrill Crow is more like what uh, Mr. MacArthur came up with, the, the zinc dust, they would uh, the zinc metal to displace the gold. And they use uh, this Merrill Crow, they will use a filter press system and they'll put uh, into the system, they'll put zinc dust, just powdered zinc, and then it'll get caught in this filtration system. And then they run the gold bearing solution. And, and this one doesn't require concentration like the activated carbon. They'll run the raw solution as it comes off the heap or comes out of the vat. They'll run it through this filter press and, uh, uh, it will capture the, the gold that's in it uh, in, onto the filter press. And again, you end up with a dark gray or almost black powder. So in the end, either way, you end up with a dark colored powder and they will dry the material out and then put it in a furnace that looks something like this. And then they will pour the material in and make gold bars. 
So let's talk about the cyanide safety basics. Again, this is not a how-to video. I'm not gonna do a comprehensive coverage on uh, how to safely handle you know, cyanide. Generally speaking, if you buy cyanide just from like a chemical supplier, you'll get a uh, powder crystal kind of substance looking somewhat like this. And you can see it's simply just a white or colorless salt. You know, I, I've seen coarse sugar that looks like this, so you just can't tell by looking at things. And then if you, but if you buy it for mining industry, the mining industry, when I used to buy cyanide, and then, hey, uh, I actually ran a small uh, cyanide heap leach operation way back when, decades ago. Uh, but when I bought it, if, and the mining product that they would give would be briquettes. And it, literally the, the cyanide is pressed into something that looks like barbecue briquettes, uh, but is white. It looks something like this. And you can see here, like I said, it looks exactly like charcoal briquettes that you'd use in your barbecue, except instead of being black, they're white. And the whole reason that's done is because of powder. You know, you can inhale powder cyanide and take cyanide into your body and have it be poison to you. And so the lower dust that they have, the better. Um, when people handled cyanide, you use a, a face mask to, you know, whatever little bit of powder that is generated, you make sure that you don't breathe any of it. None of it gets on you. You know, they would do, do personal protective gear and that sort of thing. So handling cyanide requires safety. When you're running it in a heap leach, um, one of the things about it is that it requires that the solution must be basic. If you even let it get not basic enough, it doesn't even have to get acidic. It just, as long as you don't have, if you don't have enough base in there, it will generate cyanogen gas, which is the gas they use to kill people in the gas chambers, or at least a lot of them. Um, so cyanide gas is just as poisonous as the uh, solid salt is, like sodium cyanide. They use sodium cyanide, uh, occasionally potassium cyanide, or um, also sometimes uh, uh, a calcium cyanide. Uh, calcium and, and sodium are the two most common ones that are used in the mining industry. Now, uh, how does cyanide kill you? I thought I'd just, you know, how, why is it a poison? Well, what happens with cyanide is it gets into your body and in your blood, there's a material called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the part of your blood that carries oxygen throughout your body. So when the blood flows through your lungs, it picks up oxygen, the oxygen goes into the hemoglobin, then the hemoglobin flows through your veins and, and through your arteries, and uh, actually it's through the arteries. And, and you know, it, it carries oxygen to all the muscles of your arms and legs. It carries oxygen to the cells in your brain and elsewhere. But that's how uh, your body takes oxygen from your lungs and carries it to other parts of your body. Well, what happens with cyanide is there's, there's a part of the hemoglobin that's actually a little molecule of an iron chemical. It's not metallic iron, it's an iron chemical. And, it, and it's on the blood. It, it's actually the thing that when you have your blood that doesn't have any oxygen in it and it's in, in your veins and it's blue, it goes through your lungs and goes into the arteries and then uh, it's red. It's the hemoglobin that's picked up oxygen and turned red. Well, what happens, the little iron molecule in there uh, on the, the chemical that carries blood, the cyanide gets in there and grabs hold of it. And the iron likes the cyanide better than it likes the oxygen. And so what happens is your body no longer can carry any oxygen. Your, your blood can't carry oxygen to your brain and to your other parts. And all those other parts of your body, the muscles and like say your brain and everything else, it becomes starved of oxygen and you die. It's effectively the same as drowning because when you're underwater you can't breathe in any oxygen just breathing in the water you're not gonna get any oxygen and uh, you know if you take cyanide you're not gonna get any oxygen either so that's how cyanide is deadly so because it's deadly but it has you know uses um, 
people want to think of alternatives, you know? Uh, what alternatives are there to cyanide? Well, um, people have been working on, chemists have been working on this for years and years. Uh, the alternative, whatever it is, it would have to be cheap because, you know, if it's super expensive, that doesn't do the job. It has to be efficient uh, and, and, and actually do a good job of capturing the gold out of the ores, gold and silver too. It has to be stable. It can't just be something that you add and then pff, it all decomposes and falls apart. Um, it has to be safe. You know, that's the whole point of a cyanide alternative. If you want something that's an alternative to cyanide, well, you, you want something that's, uh, that's going to be not too toxic, right? Um, it has to be simple to use. You don't want something that requires, you know, 10 chemists to keep it all balanced and everything else. Um, it, it has to be, uh, you know, it, it has to be basic or non-acidic because uh, the problem with leaching materials that are acidic is you start leaching out all kinds of other stuff. Almost all uh, uh, gold ore has some iron in it. And I, I see people every once in a while say, oh, I tried using aqua regia on my ore and it didn't work. Well, surprise, surprise, um, your aqua regia wanted to grab the iron out of the ore more than it wanted to grab the gold. And, and so you, you don't want uh, acidic things in there because then you end up, also you end up with a whole bunch of acidic iron solution and oh, what are you going to do with that? You know, it's a toxic waste. So uh, by using basic chemicals, then we're talking about acid versus base, uh, you do a lot better job. So that's what you have to find for uh, a cyanide alternative. And there's not very many good ones. You know, there's not something that easily could play cyanide. That's why we still use the cyanide in spite of its toxicity. Chlorine was used actually before cyanide. It, miners knew that, that chlorine gas could be used to uh, take out the gold out of ore. But the problem is chlorine is plenty toxic itself. It's more expensive than cyanide. It's more difficult to handle. It's not very stable. And, and so um, there actually were gold plants that ran on chlorine before the coming, before they invented the cyanide process. And uh, as soon as the cyanide process was invented, it's like everybody went, Pew! we got rid of the chlorine and went straight to the cyanide because it was so much superior. The closest thing that chemists have come up with uh, as an alternative to cyanide is thiosulfate. And it's actually used in a few places um, as an alternative to cyanide to leach gold. There are some uh, things in ores that destroy cyanide, that react with cyanide. So if you have some mineral in your ore and you put cyanide to try and leach the gold and you have this cyanide destroying mineral, it just destroys the cyanide, and then you don't have any cyanide to get the gold. And usually there's a lot bigger volume of this cyanide destroying mineral than there is of the, uh, the other. So they have to come up in, in, in places where there's no, you can't use cyanide because for whatever reason, the chemistry of your ore doesn't work. Um, thiosulfate is the alternative. And, you know, there's a lot of things about cyanide, um, I'm sorry, about thiosulfate. If you want to do uh, some research and learn about it, you know, there's lots of papers on the internet. You can Google uh, thiosulfate, thiosulfate uh, gold leaching and you'll pff, end up with all kinds of papers. Um, but it's probably the best thing that we have that's an alternative to cyanide. It's much less toxic, that is true. Um, it's a little less efficient than cyanide on gold, but it's actually a little more efficient on silver. So depending on what your ore is, the nature of your ore, eh, thiosulfate might be interesting. Uh, if you ever see things where they advertise clean leaching of gold, and it, it, it's almost always a thiosulfate-based solution. So it has its, its, its downside. It's, uh, it's not super stable. Thi thiosulfate is easily decomposed. It requires a special oxygenating chemical. So you remember with cyanide, it, it's air and water. The oxygen in the air will oxidize the gold with cyanide and produce a gold solution. With thiosulfate, it doesn't work that way. And you need something, usually they add a little bit of copper, a very small amount of copper to the, uh, 
to the mix and the copper the, actually the copper reacts with air and is then is able to oxidize the gold so there's stabilizers and other things like that to try and keep it from decomposing it also has to be kept basic um but you know there are like I say, things that use it. There's a, a number of safe leach product, products that are out there and basically all of them are using thiosulfate. sulfate. So if you are interested in finding more about leaching gold, let me tell you a little bit of the basics of things you need to think about as far as the economics. Uh, the big mining companies, the, how they're able to process low grade ores with cyanide is that they process vast amounts. Remember I showed you the heap leach piles? They're like mountains, okay? Uh, so they, they may process 30 or 50,000 tons of low-grade ore a day. Even if you processed only 10,000 tons of low-grade ore, 10,000 times a tenth of an ounce, you're talking a thousand ounces a day, and you know, that works can work out. You know, you could have a, a mining company operate on that kind of money, you know, couple million bucks a day kind of thing um, but for the small operator you know if you have 500 pounds of tenth of an ounce ore and you want to leach it okay um, your 500 pounds if you get a hundred percent of the gold in it and it's a tenth of an ounce you're gonna get uh, two and a half thousandths of an ounce of gold so you're talking a tiny fragment of a gram. And you could start to see where, uh, and most pockety ores have enough coarse material. The majority of the material is coarse. So you crush the ore and you process it. You get the vast majority, you know, maybe 80 to 90% of the gold in the rock out with your course you know whether you're using a gold cube or a sluice box or some a shaker table or something like that uh, you'll get the bulk of it with your gravity process it only makes sense to process the lower percentages if you're processing huge amounts and that's that's the big thing that's the secret of big scale mining hey, you know they're you're processing huge amounts of rock and so therefore you have good amounts of gold coming out, even though it's low grade. So a lot of guys, you know, they, they come to me and ask me questions about, well, I want to process this rock. Well, I got 500 pounds and it, it runs a quarter of an ounce. Okay, well, great. You're going to get a gram or something like that out of your, and, and crushing 500 pounds for a small operator is a big deal. For, for me to crush 500 pounds of rock with my crushing setup is a, big deal uh, it, it's work you know, you know it, it takes me most of a day to crush 75 or 100 pounds of rock okay so you know i'm looking at rock you know for myself if i process any hard rock ore it's going to have to be a lot higher grade and it's going to have to be stuff that i can recover by gravity but i just thought you might be interested to learn a little bit more about cyanide now if you want to get the skills of being a successful prospector you know what you know makes all the difference in the world and i wrote a book about that so that you could increase your skills as a prospector learn a little bit about geology learn about plaster deposits learn about metal detecting for nuggets and hard rock too okay pocket hunting and all that sort of thing covered in my book and i'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now so let me tell you a little bit more about my book um, it's called fistful of gold and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself this full of gold. And uh, you can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information, pictures, and that sort of thing. It's not in color, but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed. And so the book would have cost a lot more. It's for sale on Amazon and you can pick it up. I'll put a link in the description below. I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine. It's ICMJ's Prospecting and Mining Journal. And honestly, you should check that out. We've got stories uh, and information, legal stuff, everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector. I write articles in this every month and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So 
check the magazine out. Also, I have a website, and the website is uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below. But there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism. Don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments. But if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask, do write and, and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people and uh, you'll hear from me in, in, you know, in, in responding to you. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe, and hit the, uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos. And, you know, like it and share it if, again, you, you see stuff that you really are excited about. And I'll be coming out with lots more new videos. And so we'll see you again real soon.